and it's it's a great way to really preserve a lot of the fruit flavor, and that works in other mellow mills as well. Okay. Um, I, I find when I put my fruit in the primary with a fruit to fill it yeast, I get more fruit coming through on uh, um, when it comes out of the primary than I do if I'm using uh, a yeast that's not fruit to fill it. Um, so the K1V has been kind of my go-to. The other thing that I like about it is it's got that killer positive um, attribute to it that um, is really good for beginning mead makers, and you can <laughs> kind of get away with a few things that you really shouldn't be getting away with. But um, um, that's no excuse for poor sanitization or anything like that. But it gives you a little bit of wiggle room, it, I feel like, you know? And when I'm teaching somebody brand new to mead making, on making mead, that's usually the yeast that I'll get them started out on. And then I highly encourage people to, you know, spread out from there, do your research, try a bunch of different yeasts. Um, you know, we get so much character in our meads from the various yeasts that we use. Um, you know, it's great to try a bunch of different stuff, but... Um, I think on Pyman's the key is having something that's a, a fructophilic yeast has been one of my big successes, I think. I want to jump in here just for a minute to clarify a couple things to our listeners. I expect we probably have a lot of brand new fermenters, and I think if we don't talk about this for a minute, we're going to get a bunch of questions later down the road, so I'm wanting to answer those now in advance of them coming in a landslide. Um, and AJ, I know you make an awful lot of wine too. I don't know that I've ever bought a wine kit that didn't come with anything other than an EP 1118. Yeah, and um, I think most of mine have. There was one or two that didn't, but most of them did. Right. So to our listeners, the reason that that almost exclusively is the yeast that all the manufacturers send out with their kits is because that yeast is such an animal, it's almost impossible to, to wound that yeast. In fact, a lot of wine kits will say to, to pour your must in a container, add your water, and just sprinkle that particular yeast right on top of the must. Yep. That's yep. all you I've need to do. I've had several yeast kits that, that, there are several wine kits that that's what they said to do, yep. And I actually Sprinkle. found out by, one by doing packet. some... Yeah, mm -hmm. right, exactly. One packet, too. Um, I actually did some more in-depth study about that once and actually found that there were some scientific articles that stated that, for whatever reason that they really didn't know or understand, that uh, EC1118 was the only yeast that didn't seem to suffer from all of the things that we've said we don't want to just dry pitch on top of your must from. And so... To our listeners, please hear this and understand that EC is a very, very, very stout yeast, and we're really not advocates whatsoever of dry pitching on top of must, and I'll let um, David talk about this, but I already know that David believes in all the things that we've taught over the last several weeks as far as uh, O2 saturation with a centered stone prior to pitch. David uses the Tazna protocol. He ferments at, I think, 62 most of the time, um, three grams per gallon. So even though we're talking about wine kits, please understand that if you will do the things that we've spoken of over the last few weeks uh, in our series of making mead with modern science, um, and David, you can confirm this. You're all about all of the things that we've been talking about in our last podcast for X amount of weeks, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this is um, uh, you know these uh, these modern need making techniques have been what have allowed me to continue winning medals as I grow as a mead maker. Um, you know, like I said at the beginning of the show, what I'm drinking right now probably wouldn't meddle today. Um, and you know, it's, it's, uh, still got a little bit of alcohol heat to it, a lot on the nose 
And, um, you know, this was before I was controlling fermentation temperatures better and before I was uh, using Fermaid O in a Tosna protocol and, um, you know, really doing all of these things. And each one of these steps that I've learned about over the years, every time I employ it, I'm cutting my time in fermentation back. And so, you know, when my first batches that I was making, you know, I, I, I was taught by the people that say, no, it's a minimum year to make a good meat. It has to sit and age. You've got to put it in the corner and forget about it for a while. And that's, that's who taught me to make meat. And I'm like, well, this isn't viable on a commercial scale. How are people doing this? And so I started doing a lot of research and finding all of these different things. And I've gone from taking a year to make something that's really good to, um, you know, four months, and it's winning a gold medal with the Mazer Cup. Um, and I'm just, I'm blown away by the improvements that have been made just on my own personal need making, just by employing, um, like you said, Ryan, the oxygen at pitch and, um, pasta with, uh, Fermade O and, um, uh, controlling your fermentation temperatures, regular degassing, all of those things that we've learned, um, have just made a, a vastly better product in a shorter amount of time. Mm-hmm. And I think that's right, what you're, I mean, a lot right. of people that start mead making, they're like, I don't want to wait a year to drink this. <laughs> and, you know, I, I know some people that are drinking active fermentations, and I'm like, eh, I'll sip it, but I don't want a whole glass of that. <laughs> Back in the day when you did have to let it sit good, because though. of the old-timey techniques, um, what we'd tell them is, go make a beer, mm-hmm. and you could drink that while you're waiting for your mead to be done. <laughs> And then it was go make a JAO. Exactly. What I started doing was I just started buying more carboys. And I'm like, well, (laughs) I got to get a rotation going if I'm going to have stuff to drink. So, you know, I I think by my second year of mead making, I had 10 carboys. Sounds about familiar. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds, I think think I'm down to like five or six Mm. now. But yeah, that's about, that's about par. Yeah. (laughs) So tell our listeners um, how many grams per gallon you generally like to pitch. Um, I I typically look at somewhere between three and four grams per gallon. Um, Thank you. Uh, you know, I'll I'll stick with three when I'm down. You know, around the one point one four area. But once I start getting up around one point one six, I know that I'm going to need more yeast cells. Um, to get through all of that. And so I, I bump it up to four grams per gallon. And, you know, I, I've talked about this with a couple of people and, it, you know, I have no idea what the theoretical limit is on your pitch rate, but it certainly isn't four grams per gallon. So, um, you know, if you're going with big gravity, I would not be afraid to throw an extra packet or two of yeast in there. I mean, it's a buck twenty-five for your dry lavalin yeast. It's right. not a big expenditure. It's the cheapest part of mead making, honestly. <laughs> for sure. Okay, so now that your your stuff is finished fermenting. Um, why don't you tell us about the different things you like to do to kind of put your makeup on your sweetheart after it's done fermenting? <laughs> I like that. Um, so uh, typically with my payments, I'm shooting for a finished gravity of uh, somewhere between uh, 1.02 and 1.03 seems to kind of be the sweet spot. Um and uh, no pun intended there with the sweet spot, but uh, sure. it was. Uh, <laughs> um, so I like to shoot for that. And uh, one of the things that I've been finding lately, um, especially since I've been employing Tosna and all of that, is uh, I am way overshooting that on my fermentation. My last climate that I did ran all the way down to 0.998. Mm-hmm. And um, wow. I was fabulous at point nine nine eight, except that there's no honey left, <laughs> so um, doesn't do well in competition. Then 
Um, but it tastes like a fabulous red wine. Um, so now I'm getting to the point where, you know, when it goes down that far, I'm uh, stabilizing with uh, both uh, sulfite and sorbate, um, right. back sweetening. And every piment that I do sees copious amounts of oak. Um, I cannot stress enough how awesome oak is in not only piments, virtually every mead, but if there was ever a mead that would beg for oak, it would be a piment. And uh, I've, I've gone actually really heavy on the oak on them, and it just, it just keeps picking up the oak, and it just melds it all together and just becomes this beautiful... Oh, the aroma that you get off of it and just the, oh, it's fabulous. So anyways, um, lots of oak and I, I do find that, um, when I'm using the K1 V1116, they can tend to finish just a touch flabby and need, um, a little bit of, uh, an acid adjustment to spruce them up. And, um, um, uh, I played around, we did a whole bunch of different uh, acid trials in our mead group, and um, I have played around with a whole bunch of different blends, and I think I found the perfect blend for my piments, which is uh, uh, basically 40% malic acid, uh, 40% uh, tartaric acid, and 20% ascorbic acid. And I throw the ascorbic acid in there because it's a piment. It's got this uh, really beautiful purple plum color to it, and I want to preserve that color as much as possible. And if there's ever a need to age, it's also a piment. And I'd really like one to stand the test of time. And the ascorbic acid does have some antioxidant properties to it that, can uh, help preserve color. So um, that's what I've been using for my uh, my acid blend adjustment. And I end up just doing lots of tasting. You know, uh, it comes... Uh, uh, I, I just uh, play around with it. I do a bunch of different oak teas. Um, I've started layering oak and using um, both American oak and French oak and different toast levels even. Um, just trying to get a lot of complexity in there while still showcasing the honey and the grape. Very good. Did your first piment turn out good, David, or did it take a few go-arounds before you got something that you really felt good about? My first piment was absolutely fabulous. <laughs> I was blown away with it. And it basically started, um, I, I was uh, uh, dating a girl that was really into port. Loved the tawny port. Oh, yeah. yeah I love and I'm like, ports. you know, tawny port, this sounds, this sounds great, you know. And so I'm down there at the local homebrew shop, and this was, I think at this point, this was probably... Maybe my tenth batch of mead I've ever made, hmm. and um, I go down to the local homebrew shop and I'm looking. I see this uh, port kit, and it was just a straight port kit with actual port grapes from Portugal, theoretically speaking, or port grape juice at least, and uh, it had skins in with it as well. And I just went for it and um, threw the whole thing in a six and a half gallon carboy and threw. 14 pounds of honey on top of it, um, had a huge starting gravity of 1.165. Holy crap. And, um, yeah, it was insane. And it took, uh, about seven months for that one to finish. And, you know, this was before I was doing any kind of pasta or anything like that. Um, I wasn't even using, uh, nutrients at that point. The only thing that I was adding was, um, uh, Servomyces. Um, for those that don't know, it's basically just a uh, uh, yeast that was grown in a very nutrient-rich environment and then freeze-dried and um, allows you to um, add the little micronutrients that the yeast need in reproduction. 
Um, but I wasn't 